Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of the Skillman Foundation, Angelique Power. Thank you so much. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I am chronically early. I am a stigler for time. And so people are gonna still walk in as I'm talking, but I want us to get started. I don't wanna miss a minute of this panel. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Angelique Power. I'm the president and CEO of the Skillman Foundation. We are facing a once in a generation opportunity to transform education in America. COVID certainly disrupted traditional ways of learning but it also disrupted traditional ways of teaching. It helped us understand the holistic supports that are needed inside of schools that are part and parcel to the learning process. Schools became innovation testing grounds for technology, for food justice, and for mental wellness for students and for teachers, thereby reinventing the possibility of what schools might be in the future. In Michigan, we've watched the autos completely rethink their industry. We've watched healthcare adapt to telemedicine. We've seen even the unthinkable happen where foundations and government moved fast for a change. As extra foundation dollars and ARP dollars ebb and begin to retreat, how do we not lose the lessons of the pandemic? How do we remember we have to innovate on a dime. We have to provide more to those who need more. We need to recognize the symbiosis of our fate. We are all in this thing together. And if we are not thriving in Detroit, we are not gonna be thriving in the UP. If Western Michigan is not abundant, then Southeastern Michigan is lacking. A new report from the Citizens Research Council is getting a lot of attention this week. You have three different postcards on your table. One of them is actually the Citizens Research Council report. You can click on the QR code if you haven't seen the fullness of this report. And if the report doesn't wake you up to the urgency of this moment, you should check your pulse. The report points out that Michigan ranks 49th in population growth and has slumped to the bottom third on key indicators, including K through 12 education. We are 34th in household income, 39th in health outcomes. And then the racial and ethnic disparity, that gap has only widened. And so this is why you'll hear the Skillman Foundation and so many others advocate for really bold investment, greater than we have done in 30 years, not only to help our schools incrementally in this moment, but to doggedly reimagine the entire education system. Where do we start with this? Time and time again, evidence bears out that when you do right by communities of color and high poverty communities, those changes have a ripple effect and every community is helped. And what's become clear to many in different sectors, the business leaders of Michigan and youth organizers across Michigan, that we will not gain or sustain population until we do right by students and teachers in both urban and rural communities across the state. So exponentially more investment, that is one of the things that's needed. And what else helps to ensure growth? It's always in the soil, isn't it? Fertile communities lead to nourished land. And the people closest to the soil at Skillman, we call them the ground builders. These are educators and parents. These are youth champions who create and serve in after school programs. And these are young people themselves. So we need the ground builders. Additionally, public policy is the irrigation system. We have spent decades watering this plant 
in this area and then asking why gardens across Michigan have not bloomed. What if the ground builders, the youth, the educators, the residents, help to design policy on the front end rather than reject bad policy through non-implementation on the back end? Ground builders and policymakers leading us to equitable education systems. Okay, that's the power of and. Now I'm getting it. Now I'm getting it. Inside outside game. That always works to catalyze change, right? And we can add in the greatest asset of our time, which is Generation Z. Gen Z is currently between 12 and 28 years old. How many Gen Zers are here? They're all right here. Oh, hey. They're between 12 and 28. They are the most diverse generation to date, 48% of whom are people of color. One in five are LGBTQIA+, one in three know someone who's gender non-binary. They are intersectional in their identities and also in their analysis of what our issues are and in their proposals for solutions to these problems. They are the largest generation alive. Over a quarter of the US population, over a third of the world population. Last year, we came to the Mackinac Policy Conference with a panel of Gen Z young people. They became the youngest presenters in the history of the conference. How many of you were here for that session last year? Look at you guys. Thank you for coming back. So you may remember that we said to the audience at the end of our session, how many of you want to design with Gen Zers? How many of you want to have them come to your organization and help you think through strategy? And the room lit up with raised hands. Over this past year, we held a series of what we called Gen Z design sessions where youth strategists worked with civic and business leaders we have a short video of what the experience was. Please roll the video. I think it's vital for organizations to sit and talk to the youth, especially Gen Z, because they are the future, the future is now. So making sure that we're heard, making sure that we have that space to speak about what's going on, because we are the consumers, we are we do make up a good portion of society, and we are the community. And so, if you want to see change, it starts with us. It definitely starts with Gen Z. They're the future. I mean, short, short and simple. They're the future. Uh, Father Time always wins. We're going to pass the reins off, and this city will be their cities. People who have the most direct experience have the best insight into how things can be better. Events like these really make me feel hopeful for our future. I think it gives us a great opportunity to learn more about, you know, what's happening with our cities and what's happening in our state and moving forward with that. But it also allows youth to gain a voice. And I think it's really important, especially at our age, that we're given a platform to talk and collaborate and really engage with our community in this way and the businesses that run it. My role um, with the Gen Z design sessions is to facilitate them also just ensure that all youth's um, voice are being amplified um, in this space. What we were looking for today is for youth from all around Detroit to hear and see what's happening here in the Durf Innovation Society and then tell us what's missing. Tell us how we could improve upon hearing and respecting youth voice. We are the people who are going to lead the cities and state into the future. And so being able to be empowered in this way and gain this confidence and get to talk to people of affluence, say, hey, we don't think you're doing this right, and they actually listen and engage with it, that's powerful for how you market yourself and build yourself and carry yourself. What stood out to me most about this session is just how amazing um, our youth are and the ideas that they had. I mean, we think that we know, um, but you know, what they brought to the table today is really going to allow us to think about how we engage and approach the youth of Detroit. We need to be current. We need to understand what's going on, how young people are thinking, 
their ideas. They see the world a lot differently. They can impact us as much as we can impact them. I think the phenomenal work that the youth advisors have done um, have definitely shaped the organization and the way in which they think about engaging youth. Um, I expect that there will be long, imminent change being made after these sessions. Um, so I'm really just excited to see what comes of it. Thank you. That is another postcard that's on your table. You can learn more about the Gen Z design sessions. Um, you can go to skillman.org forward slash Gen Z. Jeremiah Thane is here. He actually was the facilitator of the Gen Z design sessions. He was on the panel last year, and he has since become a trustee of the Skillman Foundation. <clears throat> he is the youngest trustee in the history of the foundation. So um, we know that this powerful generation has ideas and they are influencing business and strategy, but they are extremely involved in public policy. And you may wonder, who are these young people? Uh, what do they care about? At Skillman last year, we also engaged the Funders Collaborative for Youth Organizing, and we produced a scan of youth organizers in Southeast Michigan. We are just releasing the report here. That's another postcard that's on your table. You can uh, click on it to the, the QR code to actually have the full findings from that report. Um, and two of our panelists actually served on the advisory committee that helped inform this report. So throughout the conference, if you wanna talk to them more about how young people are engaging in public policy, please seek them out. I will give you a little bit of the headlines from the report. Youth organizers, they tend to work on a variety of issues. Top three issues they are most concerned with are racial justice, education, and health. So during our panel, keep these in mind, and you will start to hear them in terms of analysis of issues, in proposals of solutions, and that interconnectedness that we talked about earlier. Not only are young people concerned with public policy, they are making some pretty big gains, including securing 150 million in mental health funding for schools. And Michigan Gen Zers led the nation in youth voter turnout in 2022. Remember how we talked earlier about that CRC report and where Michigan is ranking in the bottom third? Gen Z is showing up, they're showing out, and they're making sure their voice is heard. The question is, are we listening? So here to join us today are two powerful Gen Zers and a savvy political leader <laughs> who is going to join us for a conversation about just this. Let's do this. Joining Angelique Power on stage, please welcome youth education activist and communications lead at 482 Forward, Imani Harris. Co-founder and youth organizer of Black Lives Matter in all capacities and member of the President's Youth Council at the Skillman Foundation, Eva Mello Olita. And Speaker of the House for the State of Michigan, Joe Tate. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So Eva Mello, we're going to start with you. When I was 16, I had just gotten my license and I was trying not to hit like everything that didn't jump out of my way. Um, when you were 16, you co-founded your own organization. Right, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> called Black Lives Matter in all capacities. So um, tell us about the organization and what led you to create it. Okay, so Black Lives Matter in all capacities is a social justice organization that fights for the liberation of all black people, but while emphasizing and uplifting the stories and the voices of black women and girls. We, my friend and I, Amma Russell, we started Black Lives Matter in all capacities in 2020, which seems like such a long time ago now. And at the time, we truly did not expect it to turn into what it was. Um, we planned a protest in June, and things kind of went from there. In July, we heard about this young black girl, Grace, in Pontiac, Michigan, who was detained for not completing her homework. And that sounds crazy. While everything was virtual, they still decided to detain her because she failed to turn in a few assignments. 
And when we heard about that, we saw so much of ourselves in grace and we knew that this was our time to really step forward and make sure that this young black girl was going to be protected because we understand that if nobody else is going to protect us, we will protect each other. Mm. And Amma and I, we did a sit out outside the courthouse where she was sentenced. And when we didn't really get the turnout that we wanted, we knew that we had to escalate things extremely. We did an overnight occupation outside the um, detention center where she was being detained. And at 16 and 17 years old, that was really scary. And I still don't know how we did it, but the following morning, Grace was released. And we cried, <laughs> we celebrated, <laughs> but thank you. But we understood that that win, Grace being released, was only such a small part of this journey. And while Grace represented so many black girls in this work who have constantly just been never heard of, never talked about. We understood that this was our time to really just look into policy, how can we change the things at a systemic level? And that's when we got introduced to Push Out. And if you don't know, Push Out is the criminalization of black girls within the school system. And that was a word we'd never heard of before, but it was great to just finally have something to describe our experience within the school system. And from there, Things have just been kind of going, honestly. <laughs> um, we will talk more about you as a freshman, finishing your freshman year at MSU also. Okay. We will get back to that. Um, Imani, you are no stranger to the legislative process. From a very young age, you've testified in front of the state legislature. You have spoken at public forums. You have published op-eds calling for reform to education policy, calling for accountability to public officials. When you met Speaker Tate, you said, I met you when I was 16 <laughs> on the east side, remember? Um, so why did you get involved in the first place and, and what does that involvement look like for you? Yeah, <clears throat> so I got involved in advocacy work I work at right now, um, an education organizing advocacy group. Um, and I got involved with that same organizing group called 4 to Forward back when I was 14 years old. My mom was running for school board. My mom used to work for excellent schools and I just always saw my mom fighting for my education. But then something happened in 2015 that I just saw my teachers beginning to stick out. I saw um, my teachers being told that they couldn't be paid and that they still had to work because that's just what was going on. I saw emergency management just seeming to run a system that I felt like should be run by us, run by people who are experienced in it, run by people who are being impacted by it. Um, so at a very young age, my teacher gave us an assignment, write a letter to your senator. And I wrote a letter to Senator Hansen, and I just really was honest about my experience. I go to the number one high school in the city of Detroit, and I'm still experiencing all of the same inequities that I see across the rest of the city. No one should be experiencing a lack of teachers. I experienced having a permanent substitute teacher for an entire year in an English class at the number one high school in Detroit. And so I was just seeing my experience around me and not feeling like it was being reflected in the conversation. And so instead of trying to tell people how I felt on a smaller scale, I wrote my first op-ed and it went really far. It got published in the Huffington Post. It made it to the Detroit News. And from there I realized that my experience needed to be heard, needed to be shared because people didn't know what was really going on. So I got involved because of that um, and just because I realized how important it is to hear from us. Um, at my organization, we say something, nothing about us without us. There should be no conversations had about me without me in the room. And so that's what I've been fighting for since I was 15 years old. I also helped to found the Youth Organizing Coalition that is a part of 4A2 Forward now. So all of us were coming to meetings with our parents every week, every week, every week. Finally, we said, why are we not meeting? We're the ones in the classrooms every day. We know what's going on. We should be meeting. We should be protesting. We should be outside. We should be a part of the conversation. And now, I don't know if you guys know that Detroit Public School District actually has a youth, a student on their school board. Mm -hmm. That is a direct reflection of the work that I was doing when I was 14 years old. 
And so when you ask why, that's why. I think that in all conversations, in these conversations, we need to have students apart because we don't know. Even I don't know. I'm 23 now. I don't know what's happening at Renaissance High School anymore. But they do. So instead of always, you know, listening to what's going on or what you might think is best for us, I think it's just really important that you have a seat at every table. That's why I got involved and that's why I stay involved. Thank you. We're not going to touch the, the Renaissance high school versus <laughs> other things. We won't get there, even We're though the rivalry is up here. Oh, it's yeah. up here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and and we were we're going to talk later about how to keep people here. Uh, we are really grateful because Imani left for college at Northwestern, and she just moved back to Michigan. So representing <laughs> keeping people here. Um, speaker Tate. So we talked about Gen Z. It's a formidable voting block. Uh, we talked about 37 percent of Michigan young people casting ballots in 2022 leading the nation in terms of youth voter turnout. Are legislators waking up to the power of Gen Z and writing legislators? All of, those is, all of that is like very important, but what are the ways that if legislators are hip to what Gen Z is about, then how can they actually integrate them in the policy making process? Yeah, absolutely. First off, thank you for allowing me to, to to be on the panel this morning, Evamelo and Imani, thanks for everything that you're doing. I think I think there is a, a, there is a significant opportunity, you know, for us in in the legislature. I mean, we come from a, a wide range of backgrounds and ages. Um, I think for us, even looking at, at the caucuses standpoint, as you mentioned, you know, just the large voting block that Gen Z does have. That is somewhat, we're not all the way there yet, but somewhat reflected in our caucus. We have several Gen Z members, uh, too. Some of our youngest are 22 and 23 years old. So I think the work that, that Gen Z members have been doing and been able to advocate for and getting out, uh, getting out the vote is, is starting to get reflected. But I think there's certainly more, as you mentioned, you know, throughout our process. Like, yeah, I think that starts, too, with individual members really engaging in their districts and in, in, in their communities. I mean, we have a, a proactive uh, member that came over to the east side of Detroit uh, several years ago to talk about, you know, uh, Amani and her experiences, you know, as, as a student. And we certainly need more of that. Um, and we have more of a way to go in terms of how is that fully reflected? How is Gen Z fully reflected? In, in the lens of public policy making, um, and there's more that we can do. That's right, um, because they are activated and they are not necessarily beholden to one party. Mm -hmm. They showed up to vote, but not because they are going to always show up to vote for Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, they are going to show up to vote where they see their values and where they see legislators have shown up for them, right? Um, so I want to go down the line and talk about education policy. Uh, let's start with you, Speaker Tate. Will you name a few, one or two education policies that you feel must change? I think starting first is we need to move uh, towards and figure out how we continue moving in the manner of equitable funding. Mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly important in terms of what we're doing. You know, when you look at the House pass budget, we're still in the throes of the budget. I know several members in the audience know this. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you look at the House pass budget, um, you know, with the work that's being done there. So at-risk funding on the House side, we were able to get to a billion dollars uh, there. When you look at special education funding, we were able to get over two billion dollars uh, there. I think it points us in the right direction. Uh, but I think there's certainly more that, that we need to do um, there. And a couple other things, you, know, you talk about the proposals around uh, breakfast and lunch. You know, I think you can't start you know, with you know, learning and thinking about if, you, if, you, you know, if, you, if your belly's, you know, if you're hungry at, at, at the end of the day. Um, and then the third uh, that we're working through as well too is, is the mental health supports. I mean, on the house side, I mean, we've, we've, we've had about 300 million, we've proposed 300 million and voted that out for mental health services because we know that that's something uh, that's certainly a gap uh, for, for our students across the state. But 
I think first and foremost is how are we ensuring that we have equity in, in, in our school aid budget? Thank you. Eva Mello. Um, I think one thing I'll touch on is policing. Coming from a Detroit public school district, the first thing that you see when you enter our schools are metal detectors. You see police officers, you have to have your ID checked, your bags checked, even your clothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really big thing that's affecting our young people these days is feeling unsafe in our schools. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if we start redirecting a lot of these funds that we put towards our police department, we will see a really big change in the education in the lives of our young people. Mm -hmm. It is really important to understand. <laughs> it's really important to feel safe and comfortable in the school that you're in. And that's not really something that I experience. The carceral system is really something that was overshadowing the education that I wanted to receive. And then still understanding that as a black person, we are already so over policed just within our communities. And then to have that follow us into our schools is a problem. DPD, DPS is one of the only school districts in Michigan that has a police department mm -hmm. designated to all of our schools. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, these are first, second graders who are coming into contact with the police every single day, whether that's directly, whether that's indirectly, and that's a problem. And it's definitely a problem in Michigan. It's definitely a problem nationwide. But one thing I'll say, just a quick fact, is that the first school resource officer to ever be implemented in the United States was in Flint, Michigan. So clearly we see a pattern of these things in Michigan and we understand that's something that definitely has to change. Thank you. Imani, one or two policies you'd change? Sure, um, I wanna go back definitely to the Tate's point about uh, full and equitable funding. I think at my organization, we believe that we need to reinvest in Detroit specifically in our neighborhood schools. Right now in Detroit, half of our students attend charter schools half of our students attend DPSCD, traditional public schools. And what that means is that our traditional public schools are getting half of the per people funding that they need to survive. Um, we see right now the COVID dollars are going away. I don't know if you see in the news right now, DPSCD is talking about cutting certain positions that are um, just necessary, we think, attendance officers, right? And summer school programs are just being cut down because really the district cannot afford it. And so at 4A2 Forward, what we believe is that we need to reinvest in a district that has been strategically disinvested in. Historically, over time, we've seen it happen. We need to reinvest in our neighborhood schools. And I don't think that we should be scared of a formula. We call it a weighted funding formula, but a formula that gives more to students who need more. I don't think it's bad to say that maybe Grosse Point students don't need as much as Detroit students need right yep, now. Yep. So let's funnel that more than where it needs to go. Thank you. So that's one of the policies that I wanna look at. And another thing that we know at 42 Forward is the two largest issues with educating our students right now are chronic absenteeism and summer learning loss. Those are two things that we know need to be addressed. So cutting summer school, not a great thing right now for our public schools. But also there are things that um, contribute to chronic absenteeism. Transportation is one of them. And that's not just an education problem, that's a city problem. And so how are we also working with the city to fill in the gaps that maybe the district or maybe the education money cannot fill? Um, so those are just a few things. Thank you, thank you. Um, so often when we have conversations around equity, we talk about what we just did. We talk about here's the current state, here are things that we wanna change. So let's imagine a liberatory future. Let's imagine schools as we deserve them, as we envision them to be in the future. So will you complete the sentence? In the future, in this liberatory future, schools will look like this. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I would say um, schools across the state can receive a world-class education wherever you come from. I would say schools look safe. Schools look like a home 
Mm. They look like a place where you come to learn, make connections, and just really educate yourself and get applied knowledge that we can finally take back into the real world. Mm. I would say um, my dreams for schools right now would just be that they bring back hope to the communities and hope specifically to my city, that they can just be a place of world building and not preparing for factory life or preparing for you know, m many of things. I believe that they can be a place of inspiration, a place to discover yourself, to discover knowledge and discover applied knowledge. And most importantly, I believe that they should be run by the communities. So in my dream world, parents and students are making all of the decisions for our schools. Mm. Amen. Um, so, Speaker Tate, you talked about the weighted funding formula, and funding plays a really big role in this. We know ARP dollars are going away. Um, the Michigan Senate proposed a 6% increase in the foundation allowance, which would bring the per pupil student amount up to 9700 right? And then you also mentioned that there would be some additional supports that can be pulled from different areas for special needs students. Um, uh, English language learners, um, for equitable needs, I think is, is said, but I don't know exactly where that falls or where that comes from. And that is great. I do not want to take away from that. That will be historic to have $9,700 per pupil plus extra. It's not the weighted funding formula. And it's sort of reliant on this year, this budget, this administration. What will it take to actually get us to a weighted funding formula that might include a poverty index that is about Detroit, but it is about rural areas mm -hmm. across Michigan. Mm -hmm. What will it take to get us there? I think there has to be an all hands on deck approach. I mean, we know, and I know that there are a lot of leaders in this audience that have been working on, on this for, you know, dare I say decades, around how do we get to this point where, where, we, make, where we make this better. So I think first and foremost, it, it is, it's, it's around, you know, how do we set up and how do we, how do we actually agree to what is, what is the problem? Because we know too that, you know, sometimes that there are differences in terms of, of problem setting and, and challenges. What, how can we agree upon that? And then how do we direct all of our, all of our resources there towards, towards these goals, to, towards the needs uh, around that, and that that takes time. I mean, a lot of that too, in terms of the work that we do. You know, we know that elections have consequences. You know that it, it's always at times a dynamic uh, place. But if we can identify and all agree, and 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 maybe not always all agree, because <laughs> we don't necessarily do that. Um, um, but get to a place is we know what we know what the gaps are we can all agree on in terms of what the problem is and be able to direct those resources there. And that, that takes a lot of time, that takes a lot of persistence. And that's why we need a Gen Z a generation to be involved because by the time, you know, they will me out, out um, you know, they're going to be in and they're already in. So I think it's gonna be incredibly important to have that input and to have that engagement because it's going to be a long-term process and for us to get to that place and to, to meet our aspirations where we're supposed to be. Thank you. Um, Imani, we talk a lot at the Skillman Foundation about not just the teacher shortage, the need to recruit and retain teachers, but in particular BIPOC teachers, teachers of color. You talk about this too. Why is this important? Yeah. So I wanna start by saying that I am a black girl raised from black girl teachers. I've always had black teachers and they were instrumental to who I am today. Angelique talked about me graduating from Northwestern. I graduated with a degree in journalism and a double major in black studies. And so I am a person that has just been built up by black teachers, black love. And I think it's really important to see yourself when you're being taught um, I don't think, you know, one of the things I struggled with a lot at Northwestern was not seeing myself and really feeling like I shouldn't be here. And so then what's the implication in elementary school, in middle school, in high school of never seeing yourself reflected in your teacher or in the curriculum, right? 
Um, and so I definitely think it's important for us to recruit teachers of all backgrounds, of all cultures, so that one, students can feel the culture that they're used to, but also so students can be exposed to different cultures that they might not know, different languages, different foods, different books, right? I talk a lot about how being a student raised by black teachers, I read black books, but then I'll go out and hear, they weren't in the curriculum, by the way. My teachers were giving me their personal books to read. Oh, you're, you're above grade level, you should try this book. Actually, I know your mom is a pastor, so you might like this book. Just taking personal interest in me as a person and developing me individually. And so just the importance of having a teacher that sees you, that understands where you come from, that really matters. And what I also wanted to say is DPSCD actually has a 82 percentage rate of black teachers. So I think in DPSCD, we're actually doing it right. We have the black teachers. The problem is that we need to be able to pay them. We need to be able to compensate them. We need to be able to retain them. Otherwise, other cities are competition and they need teachers as well. And so when we talk about needing teachers of color, BIPOC teachers, we also gotta be able to pay them and pay them right and pay them what they're worth. And so I think a way we can do better on retaining and finding black teachers is A, paying them, but also just investing in teaching programs at a younger age. Um, I think I see a lot of students who are like a teacher, absolutely not. It just doesn't seem like an attractive job right now. How can we make it more attractive, more accessible, more attainable, and a, a fun looking job, should I say? That's what I'll say about um, teachers. Just before uh, the Mackinac Policy Conference, the Detroit Academy of Arts and Sciences announced they would be paying their teachers $100,000 a year. See? Um, so, Eva Mello, I want to talk about what Michigan needs to do around its population. And we did an interview yesterday, which was super fun with Cranes, and uh, this question came up and you both had different answers. The question was, um, would you stay? Or why would you stay? Or do you want to stay in Michigan? You are young, you are talented, you are black, you are beautiful. How do we get you to stay? <laughs> And Imani, you said, I'm coming back and a lot of my friends are coming back and we're here and Detroit is fantastic. And Eva Mello, what did you say? I want to stay, but I don't know if I will. Mm -hmm. And if I do stay, it'll definitely be because of the people. Um, especially in Detroit, I think the love of community, the love that we all have for each other is definitely a reason to stay. But when you think about things like transportation, whether it's reliable, is it accessible, and you look at places like New York where they have reliable and accessible transportation everywhere. I think it's really interesting that we call ourselves the home of the Motor City, but we don't have reliable transportation everywhere. And I think that it's almost laughable sometimes, <laughs> honestly. And I would say also, how are we caring for our young people? Are we putting the same amount of effort and love that we put into so many other things in our society back into the most valuable assets that we have, which are our youth? Thank you. Um, so there are lines in the budget around placemaking to create more transportation, more walkability, and seeing those in certain districts across Michigan. I'm saying this to you, Speaker Tate, just so that you can carry this with you. No. Not, not you. just a suggestion, <laughs> not, a, not lobbying. Um, <laughs> um, I wanna ask the audience, how many of you participated in after school programming? So basically almost everyone and obviously, if you participate in after school program, you become a fancy pants who gets to come to the policy conference. But for the very first time in our history, there's money in the budget proposed to go to out of school time programming, 50 million, which is a historic amount. So um, Speaker Tate, can you talk about why this is important? I think it's a good, I mean, just, I think the audience um, recognized the importance of it as well too. But I mean, when you look at all of the, the beyond anecdotally, I mean, and people going latchkey kids or, or, you know, playing sports or other extracurricular activities, that was such a big part in, in shaping, in, in shaping, you know, 
youth and, and as a kid. So, and you see where the, the, the data is around that. Like having those after school supports is kind of paramount, is paramount to development of, of kids and, and just kind of that social emotional learning piece as, as well too. And, um, you know, I, I had a bias towards, you know, more physical activity and we know like how, how, how that is plays such a large role in, in development. So it's, I don't think it's, it's in either or certainly, it's, it has to be an and with those investments in, in after school programs. Uh, what was the sport you played? Ice, <laughs> ice skating. Uh oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> no, <that was laughs> okay, all right. Um, we're going to open it up to the audience and take some audience questions. I know we have some microphones that are moving around. Please raise your hand, raise your hand high if you have any questions for our panel. Okay, Margaret. <laughs> I have no intro for it. So once upon a time, I was in education in Detroit, and one of the things that we saw happening, and it happens frequently, something good opens up, and it's designed for lower-income kids, underserved community, and then affluent people discover it <laughs> and start to populate it, and it shifts. Schools that I was operating. 86% free and reduced lunch. We got good. We were graduating kids, sending them to college in really high numbers. By the time I left, it was 50% mm -hmm. free and reduced. How do we prevent um, affluent people from taking choices away from kids and young folks who need them more? Oh, you wanted to throw a hard question. <laughs> okay. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> Speaker table. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you're right, and, and that's a that's a great point. You know, as we are thinking about it, and that's why we continue. How do we continue to have, you know, resources aligned with 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 our goals uh, for the future? And and sometimes those goals take years and and decades. But kind of having that point in terms of of how we get to what we what we want to do and and to the point you know we we go back to um elections as well like you know again they they have consequences so how do you find those individuals like the work that we do in lansing you know how do how do we identify those people and and those individuals that want to run and want to push that button in lansing and say hey like this is a priority and this is going to be a priority for me that you know equity um, in in how we do it um, is going to be a priority and, and 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 we don't move off of that so i think that's going to be i think that's important and that's how we have to to in, in my mind kind of look at how we stay the course um, with with challenges you know like that I'm going to channel Anika Goss and uh, Detroit Future City and say that uh, we actually do need to create more, support more of the middle class living in Detroit. And so um, neighborhoods that attract different families for the schools, different levels of economics, I think that's important. I also think we should set goals for ourselves for Detroit to stay a black city. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to have mixed income, have mixed races, and still hold the majority black chocolate city that we are, and see that as a measurement of success. What other questions do we have? Yes. Jametta. Oh, OK. <laughs> Greetings, and thank you so much. Uh, Jametta Lilly, CEO of the Detroit Parent Network. And I just want to first uh, literally give you a hug and embracing <laughs> for all of the leadership that all four of you have been doing. You. So one of the things I just, I'm wondering about, and I'm particularly zeroing in on our two young sisters right there. Um, as we talk about this wonderful time period in Michigan where we finally now have a legislation and administration supporting equity, 
or moving us closer to it. Uh, we have foundations, uh, so many that are in the room that are moving us towards equity. But how might we begin to have a better uh, intergenerational lens in conversation about solution building? Because we know the reality is, is that children grow up with parents, and parents have to be part of the equation and solutions for change with youth. What would you say to many of us in the room who are parents, but also are with organizations that work with parents? How do we begin to have this dynamic that begins to pull everyone into the kind of power building that we need to facilitate the change that we know Michigan needs? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I think to begin, listening is a really, really big part. It's something that we talked out, we talked a lot about in our FCYL report, which I would love to discuss with you further after this. But listening to young people is how you learn. Mm -hmm. And I think when we have these intergenerational conversations, these are a very great place. This is a very good start, at least. And I think listening is only one part, but how do you listen and then also apply all of the knowledge and everything that these young people have told you into action? Yeah, the only thing I wanna add to that is, um, and I'm so happy that um, I have uh, someone that I was a part of the Mosaic Youth Theater with, my own Delachey Strader is here. Um, and I would just love to kind of talk about how I learned from a young age how to have these intergenerational relationships, which one of the first things that DLSA always talks about is building boundaries and building trust. Mm -hmm. You can't have these conversations if you don't first talk about how far are we willing to go, what are we willing to talk about, and what's off the table for talking mm -hmm. about aligning visions. And if the vision don't align, maybe the conversation don't need to be had. But it's really just about setting that base, setting that tone first with the people that you're trying to build relationships with, and not just going in and saying, oh, I want to have these relationships that might kind of be surface level, because they might be transactional sometimes, or they might be tokenism sometimes, or they might feel like tokenism, even though that's not the intention, because that base conversation was not had about what's our goals, what's our vision, what's our dream for this. So definitely listening, and even after you listen, listen some more, listen to learn, and then talk, have the hard conversations about what are the barriers, what are the boundaries, what's the hard parts, have those hard conversations, and just being open. Thank you. Uh, good, I guess a good, still good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm Ken Donaldson, I'm the president and CEO of Black United Fund of Michigan. We're a youth empowerment organization. And not too long ago, um, I had a reality check. Uh, I've been in the community for over 45 years uh, hosting programs for youth. We had an intern that worked at our organization. Uh, she was at one of the top schools. Uh, she was an A student, and she got kicked out of the school. And so I explained to her, I said, well, honey, what's, what's wrong? Why, you're smart, you're beautiful, but you're, you're getting kicked out of school. I said, don't you, don't you believe in a positive future and looking forward to being successful? All of a sudden, she just started crying. Mm. I mean, just water started pouring down her face. And she said to me, Mr. Donaldson, you have no idea what my environment looks like. Mm. She said, I live in a home where my mother has a living boyfriend. My brother is selling drugs. And the community is infested in everything. She said, where am I going to find hope? Mm. And so um, I got lost for words. She just caught me totally off guard. And I said, how do we inspire these young people that are in those environments that don't give them hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to speak to that. Um, I actually did research at Cody High School about chronic absenteeism, and our question was, why are students chronically absent? We try to answer that question all the time for ourselves. Let's ask students, why are you guys chronically absent? And one of the number one things that we heard was, why come to school when we feel like even after we graduate, what are we stepping into? Mm -hmm. It's a hopeless society. Just like you said, I live in almost what feels like a hopeless generation, which is that I gotta get out mentality of when I get out, I'm not coming back because it feels like there's nothing here. What I would say is all of the organizations that I was a part of are what gave me hope in what felt like a hopeless city. The Mosaic Youth Theaters, the 4A2 Forwards. I actually just started um, an organization called Hey Black Girl, we do healing empowerment and yoga. And just to have a space 
where black girls can come and be happy and not have to be a sister or a mom or an auntie or a cousin, but just to have spaces where you just love and I'm not asking anything of you, I'm only pouring into you. I think those spaces are detrimentally important because they don't exist at home all the time. So I would say investing in all of the programs that are trying to get students out of those environments and exposed to more is just one thing. I think you definitely said it all. <laughs> um, I think I'll also add, though, that hope is a discipline, and hope is something that you do in practice. Mm -hmm. And kind of like what we've been talking about with these after-school programs, putting more funding back into spaces designated to just young people. It is really important that young people have areas in their life and people that they can go to where these things are not transactional, where you're coming just to love, just to be in space and community with people who look like you, with people who understand you. Because a lot of times I think adults forget that, especially because of COVID, young people no longer have spaces that are just for them. A lot of young people that we see now, the younger and younger that they get, they are going into jobs, they are working. And a lot of young people, once again, are are not gonna go to school because they're working. Mm. Even like the young lady you're talking about, sometimes things are just really out of our control. Sometimes our environment, we are only a product of our environment. So I think getting young people while they're still young, getting them while they're still a little naive and vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that they really have just a chance to learn and we can really just put more funding and more love back into them. My name is Tanya Hill, and I'm a business owner, but I am also the uh, board chair for First Tee, uh, which is a nonprofit that teaches children uh, life skills through the game of golf. I want to applaud you young ladies, and I want to say that you give me hope, and I appreciate that. I think from an adult looking back um, and seeing what's going on in our world and our society, our history has been left out of this country. Mm. And my oldest daughter is re-educating me on a lot of history that I was not taught mm. when I was in school. And I just want to share one book, and this is for people of color, but especially for people who aren't of color. Because if you don't understand the history and the systemic racism that we constantly have to deal with. It's a burden that we carry from the time we are born to the time we die. And unless our non-black and brown brothers and sisters really understand that, they can't help us. And, and it's hard for us to help ourselves. The Three Mothers by Anna Waleka Tubbs mm -hmm. is the story of Malcolm X, James Baldwin, and Martin Luther King's mothers. It gives you an historic perspective, inspection of what black women in particular had to deal with growing up in America and how they had to raise and protect their kids. And I think it's so important that all of us understand all of the history of this country and then we can begin to solve some of these systemic problems that we talk about every year that are not getting done. So that's, I'd like for you to comment on that. I mean, I don't know if there, if there needs to be a comment besides thank you. Yeah. Thank you, you are educating us and you are sharing things with us. We do have a Gen Zer in front who has been raising her hand. Can we hear her voice? Uh, good morning, my name is Yvonne Navarrete. I'm the policy director with We the People Michigan as a Gen Zer and someone that grew up as an undocumented student in the city of Detroit. And a lot of those um, issues that you all are raising really resonate with me in terms of uh, the influence of access to transportation and the importance of after school programs in really shaping the people that you become. Um, I was someone that was very high achieving very, um, we had all these big goals, really wanted to be involved as much as possible. But something that hasn't been mentioned yet that played a really big role for my family was my um, parents had to engage in a really high level of risk to drive me to school every single day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to drive me to after school programs. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember in particular one day my mom driving me to this event that was um, near downtown and she stops and has a panic attack mm. because we're near the tunnel to Canada. She doesn't have a driver's license because undocumented people can't get a driver's license in the state of Michigan right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a reality and common aspect of um, commitment, perseverance, et cetera, that um, is very prevalent in the city of Detroit, right? Like, our parents do whatever it takes to put their kids forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry that I'm emotional. No, it's absolutely <laughs> um, fine. But um, my mom shouldn't have had to take that much risk, right? Mm -hmm. And she did it anyway, and her kids, me and my two brothers have degrees from U of M, um, Brown University, Harvard University, and the University of Chicago. And I want more kids like me to be able to be like that. And it shouldn't require their parents risking being with their family to do that. So how can we make uh, restoring access to driver's licenses in the state of Michigan a priority for the sake of the safety of our parents and students in our schools? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so, so so much. Thank you so much. I can't wait to talk to you after. I just want to say, I know you probably have more to say this. I know there's a drive safe yeah. bill that has been proposed. I know that there should be, there was supposed to be a session. It seems like the sessions keep getting pushed back. I don't know what's going on with that, <laughs> but yeah. my organization and a lot of organizations that we work with are definitely 100% supportive. I hope to see you at the sessions in Lansing. If you can make it, um, just let us know because we're definitely supporting those bills. There should be that should not be an issue for anybody getting to school safety. And I think another thing, another level of that is the safety as far as Michigan was having trouble bringing ICE into schools sometimes in the 2018, y'all know that era, right? Mm -hmm. In that era, we were really having to promote safe schools for our undocumented students. And so just making sure that we keep up with that and keep track of that. And I'm glad that you brought it up because we didn't. And I can touch on, I know we've talked about the drive safe package uh, too, and I know that's still you know, work that we are doing. I know that there are bills that have been introduced. And I know one of the things that I touched on, and which again, th this is a great committee around it. Like we are, we are moving towards kind of this, this, this broad aspirational goals. We know where we need to be. And I'll use several examples. And when we look at school aid, just you know, for an example, like there is incremental change that needs to get done in, in trying to create and, and find a path. We use examples like gun violence reduction, which we couldn't get a hearing on in over a decade. Mm -hmm. You look at Elliot Larson and expanding civil rights, that took four decades to, mm -hmm. to happen. That, that literally took four decades mm -hmm. to happen. When we talk about trying to lay a path or, or anything else that we've kind of touched on, that's why it, it's so important that we do have kind of that persistence, that we do have those goals, that we do bring in the next generation because I think that is incredibly important in terms of what we do in Lansing and how we have to have you know, those conversations with groups a uh, broad array of groups, because as much as we want to get to a place, we know that the path to get there is not always straight. Sometimes it's windy, sometimes it, it takes years, sometimes it takes, unfortunately, decades in terms of what we want to do, but, uh, but I think persistence for us, I think is gonna be important, and, and, and that's, that's how we get to, to the end state of getting and reaching our aspirations is kind of those step-by-step -step measures for us to get there. Thank you um, for speaking and for bringing We the People with you. Um, actually, in the population study, you'll notice that one of the recommendations is to increase the immigrant population in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And there are things that follow that that have to do with policy, like translating English language into a lot of different languages and providing dollars to do that so that it doesn't have to be a fearful experience, but a welcoming experience that is understood that it's tied to the prosperity of Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, I know there are more questions, and I know that I'm watching the clock tick down. So I'm looking at Marnita. 
what are, what's the, we can, okay, I'm looking at Bev and Marnita. Okay, one more. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Wasim Mahfouz and I am a proud immigrant. Uh, I am the chief executive officer of a nonprofit organization uh, called Leaders Advancing and Helping Communities. We serve Wayne County. And I'm proud to say that uh, many of uh, the Gen Z uh, have graduated from one uh, of our programs at LEHC, be it a scholarship program, a youth leadership rich college program, and now they became state representatives, mayors, uh, deputy attorney general, and uh, we're extremely proud of the work that we do. One of the things that was mentioned today is safety in school. And uh, as a father of uh, two children, 18 and 13 years old, it's a constant fear. Every day I send my children uh, to the schools. Um, what could be done at the uh, policy level, at the state level, especially now that uh, Democrats have control over both chambers, that uh, uh, we can change uh, policies and laws when it comes to, uh, to, to gun. Uh, um, I think this is a very important um, topic. Yeah. Speaker Tate, I know that you are working on some of these things. Do you want to give a quick answer? Yeah, just quickly, and that's a great question. I mean, we, we've been able to do some work around gun violence reduction with universal background checks, safe storage, and extreme risk protection orders. I think that's the foundation. We have more to go. It, when you see in our budget kind of next steps is, is investments in community violence intervention. So really down, getting down to the, to the community level. But there will be more policies as, as, as we go along. But you're absolutely right. And even, you know, this, this is never again do I, I, I want to say to a parent that's lost a child due to gun violence, like what, what did you do? And again, it was a long time coming for us to get here. We're trying to, going to try and move as quickly as we can, but there's more work and then there's more feedback that we need from, from our younger generation to, to help inform how we make the best policy around that. Thank you all for joining us today. Obviously, we need different education policy in Michigan. Our policy is suited for a Michigan of yesterday. We need it suited for a Michigan of tomorrow. We need young people to help get us there. Thank you for coming.